for the time because we're running very late. Thank you. So. Thanks a lot. Yeah, like first of all, um, Rivka, thank you very much. I'm very excited and very honored to, to have the possibility to speak here. And um, I know as well that I'm a bit with the back to the wall now, then otherwise the food would get cold. And what will happen afterwards? Yeah, I have to keep the schedule. So I'll uh, start uh, directly. The starting point of my, sto of my story today is the winter of 1799 in Paris. On November 9th, the date known as the 18th Brumaire, a coup d'etat of an elite liberal alliance brought the Republican government of the French Directory to an end. While in the capital city, far from the public eye, a new constitution was being drafted, a dyer from a small community of saint sernin in the Aveyron department found the youngster in his barn. As he was said to have lived alone for a long time, the youngster was considered to be a feral child. The finding of the boy produced a cascade of events which brought him to public attention, and in a short time, he was also given a name, Victor the Wild Boy of Aveyron. A well-known story, Truffaut made a film about it. But what was so different about this particular event in winter 1799? The answer has to do with the relations between the discovery of Victor and the political coup. Both events revolve around the same question. What does it mean to constitute political freedom through violent and coercive means? In early 1800, the Parisian vaudeville piece, quickly celebrated by the press, gave this question in a theatrical form. Without knowledge of his rights, Never could he have been truly free, and our ignorant in the woods didn't know he had been free. Thus, as he is well arrested, and all men shall be free, with purpose did we arrest him, to inform him that he is free. <laughs> can identify with this, is still true. The irony here concerns the contradiction between the idea of a freedom and state power. When freedom is defined by state power, it might turn into a repressive act that requires no justification anymore. Moreover, the Republican project of transforming men into a living encyclopedia, as we just heard from Moritz, unfortunately he's not there, um, namely the organized information of humans that is supposed to secure their freedom, has collapsed through its violent actualization. Like we are now in a moment of uh, like dystopia somehow like this, uh, of this reformation of society. To this I would like to add another epistemological dimension. Victor stands beyond these conflicting positions of critique of state and Rousseauian nature fantasies and becomes an object of scientific observation, a project which for a brief period between 1799 to 1804 meant that human regeneration could be possible only if separated from direct political intervention of state power. The importance of the case and its political dimension can be seen in the reaction of the Société des Observateurs de l'Homme, the Society of the Observers of Men, a group of scholars founded in the same year in Paris, like directly after the coup of the Brumaire, the society uh, gets created, and in 1804, when uh, the consulate ends and the empire begins, it vanishes. But it starts without a clear act of constitution, and it vanishes without an act of, uh, of disappearance. Four days after the first report on Victor's discovery arrived in Paris, members of the society decided to have him immediately brought to Paris to be observed by experts. The society consisted of a heterogeneous group of natural scientists who became prominent during the Republic. These included Georges Cuvier, Philippe Pinel, and Bernard de Jussieu, as well as exilic Catholic royalists like the deaf-mute teacher Roche Ambroise Sicard, and rising figures of the late Republic, like young philosopher Joseph Marie de Gerando, whose work will be the focus of my paper. Two special characteristics of the society should be mentioned. First, it was the only society of scholars formed independently from state authority during the time of the consulate, 
and its constitution was only reported by means of uh, press and, and media, so to say. Second, its concept of the observation of humans, a program with which it made public appearance in the Brumaire times, like that the observation of humans stand in the center. In historical research, this society had long time been seen as an exemplary case that formed the passage to the modern positivistic human sciences. Jean Picavet, in the end of the 19th century, referred to them as ideologue. This school, with its attempts to formulate a uni united monistic human science, was understood to be a philosophical core of the republican ideal of social transformation. In his recent studies, Jean-Luc Chappé, however, questioned this narrative, showing that the society cannot be understand, understood within a homogeneous, programmatic manner. It was not so much human science in the service of republic, but a group gathered around an idea of the observation of men, an idea which became their middle ground, but also allowed members to peruse their different political and scientific agendas. While these studies exemplify the special sociological character of the society, they do not suggest an answer to the question of how such a project could gain such attraction, and why did such a project need to demonstrate its distance from the government. In order to address this question, we should first come to terms with the concept of observation they were aiming to develop. This can be seen in the words of uh, Gerando from his prize-winning essay on the relation between science and ideas published in 1800. As for Moritz, I as well translated it from French to English, so it's all on my uh, own responsibility. Observers need a kind of inspiration, Gerando says, which is comparable to the one of the artists. So we're now coming and linking a couple of points which already have uh, come up and are still very present uh, in this moment, like uh, covering the century. But for them, it's even more rare and more difficult because their inspiration has to be associated with the equilibrium, equilibrium of all the faculties, the liberty of reason and the calmness of the senses. Thus, for experimental knowledge, all faculties of our mind lend each other mutual help. The attention observes what is, memory conserves what has been observed, and imagination prepares new subjects of observation. From this rich citation, I would like to point to several aspects that are important to my argument. First, the comparison between the observateur and the artist, the method of invention, like we heard from Dickler before, Observation is not only about following instructions and methods, it is also attached to the instinct of creation, a cognitive process which cannot be formulated. On the one hand, observation is regarded as a creative activity. On the other hand, it is defi defined by attention in a dynamic interrelation of spiritual faculties. Second, the relation between liberty and reason. The critical point in Gerando's formulation is that observation is in different ways related to a creative process of the individual and to an effort to conserve the order of the operation of the, human, of the faculties of the mind. These different mental faculties are dependent on each other and interrelated to each other. This is described as the freedom of reason and the calmness of the senses. What we have here is the rejection of an abstract ideal of freedom and the naive republican attempt to actualize it. The political problem of freedom, highlighted by the events of the Brumaire, is transformed into an epistemological problem. How to order and mutually secure the different and at the same time contradicting operations of the mind. In other words, a shift from an attempt to use encyclopedic knowledge to bring about social and political transformation to a project of administrating, administering the spirit constituted not by state authority, but by self-discipline. If we read the dictionaries of the academy, we can see that the original meaning of observation is the active following of a political agenda or law. For De Gerando and his colleagues, observation meant not only a technique for the production of scientific knowledge, 
but adherence to specific rules. In her studies on scientific observation, Lorraine Destin placed the focus on the epistemological virtues of scientists and the creation of the scientific self. Observation in the context of the 18th century, according to Destin, must be understood as a praxis of actively ordering variety and sensations. Her studies allow us to posit the question in which way the change of specific scientific paradigm of observation had to do with this shift in the political order, and second, how scientific methods of observation may be considered as an attempt to react and respond to those political changes. In what follows, I would like to show how the program of the observation of men became an answer to the problem of liberty and how the self can be understood as a technique that produces liberation by captivating observation. To do this, I would first like to show that the method of observation developed by De Gerando mm -hmm. provides an open space beyond the authority of state or the confinements of the ideology or like uh, authorized philosophy. In the second step, I will use the case study of Victor to demonstrate how this method of observation was systematized and applied. And in the conclusion, I will suggest a redefinition of Gerando's project as what I call a metaphysics of self-administration. Sorry. Gerando can be considered a rising star among the upcoming careerists of the new order of the Brumaire. Sponsored by the liberal elite who designed the new state apparatus, Gerando's first important philosophical essay in early 1800 manifests this complex relationship between the project of observation and the social reality of post-revolution France. The revolution generated the necessity of mutual observation between people. Each individual, so Gerando suggests, should be able to observe the plurality of other individuals with attention and care. His treatise was a four-volume treatise on, the, on science and uh, the relation to ideas, which had to do with, as well, learning to read the science, like something that perhaps Carlo Ginzburg as well called the paradigm of indis, in, in, in this, indices. How, I don't know what's the English word, but... but um, the observer is for Gerando an epistemological counterpart to the turnover of the order and an essential actor in the pro project of its restoration. Restoration and regeneration in Gerando's terms meant first of all a fundamental critique of the power of philosophical methods to reform men as well as a critique of the impotence of the connection between philosophy and state power as seen in the project of national education during the directory. For Gerando, this philosophical political project was simply not enough. To have reformed, Gerando um, states in this treatise, the instruments of reason which we use, it is still necessary to reform ourselves. Of all endeavors, this is perhaps the most difficult because it is only dependent on our own will. The philosopher can achieve the first goal but he can only indicate the second by, given, by giving an example of it through himself. Through this difference between the instruments of philosophy and the reformation of the self, Gerando pointed to a space of self-referentiality which located beyond any specific philosophical method or language. There is no ideal of self that can be set as a target. Rather, through the distance between the instruments of reason and the reformation of the self, an interactive process takes place in which concepts and methods can be acknowledged. Only in relation to an effort that lies beyond the direct influence of philosophy is the project of the reformation of the instruments of thought valuable. The practice of self-reform and self-observation creates a sphere beyond philosophy which Gerando defined as the space of morality. In distinction, but also as a complementary to the method of philosophy, Girando poses the exemplar. An example or it is the exemplary leading of one, one's own life, the exemplary nature of the self as a product. 
against the authority of philosophy and reason and the central question of how they could influence the moral of the people, Girando poses the question of how mor moral, morals, moral, could serve the progress of philosophy. With this inversion, the advance, advancement of knowledge becomes linked to the existence of a regime of individuals constituted by self-observation and self-control. The order of morality is not an order of ideals or concepts, but it is bound to the attention and generally to the activity of self-reflexivity and self-control. Observation provides a form of establishing a link to the self which must be produced by individuals themselves, independently from state authority. But to put it in a paradoxical form, individuals have to produce themselves by means of observation. This is what Gerando calls the empire of oneself. It is not the philosophers we should complain about if we have gone astray. We only have ourselves, our own weakness to blame. Here all precepts of logic fall within the realm of morals. They are related to the advice which is very easy to be demonstrated, but very difficult to follow. Conserve the empire of oneself. This imperative places Gerando apart from the Republican and Encyclopedic project as well as from the reactionary critics of enlightenment as such. I cannot in my remaining time elaborate on the various philanthropic, scholarly and economic societies or to sketch the religious projects in which he was active. It should be noted, however, that these activities beyond the state do not contradict in any way with his duties as a high official in French administration from 1804 onward, where he was general secretary of the Ministry of Interior during the empire. Quite the opposite. Against governing men by philosophy, which is always a political science, Gerando poses the self-control of the individual. The creation of individuals as subjects of observation of their own selves is tantamount to the responsibility of individuals whose faults and complaints can only be accounted for by their weakness. Freedom as self-control or self-domination is not something to be administered and distributed by a higher authority or something related to a specific form of government. Freedom is a particular form of the active self-reference of the individual, which must be beyond the reach of political authority. Thus, rule cannot be reduced to monitoring and centralized control, but by a constant activity of observation. The necessity of observation, of observing the self and others, as described by Gerando, makes a clear space for the human individual beyond, beyond political or philosophical authority. I would now like to come back to the case of Victor and make it clear in what way the method of observation was presented as a transformational tool for generating a moral self. Around 1800, it was not enough for a specific program of human sciences and observation to proclaim itself. It had to prove itself as a useful science through an example. For the actors of the um, Société des Observateurs de l'Homme, it was clear that Victor was predestined object to prove their point. He was an exemplary case not only in the sense that the power of observation to create a moral being could be proven through him, but that this could be presented as a theatrical public experiment. In the line with the critique of an abstract philosophy and its views of the human mind, Victor should be the example of the regenerative power of the method of observation. It took half a year for the Société until they could get Victor into their hands. In his transfer to Paris in autumn 1800, Gerando was part of a commission together with Georges Cuvier and Philippe Pinel who should decide what was to be done with the child. While Pinel and Cuvier classified the boy as an idiot, who should be accommodated in a Parisian asylum, Gerando arranged for a young doctor, Jean Itard, to become Victor's uh, examiner. Gerando and Itard shared an idea of moral observation that was based on the assumptions that the mind and ideas were not something given. In our Frankfurt project, Lauren Schlich just uh, um, gave in his dissertation on different kinds of model objects around 1800, which were 
several of them at this specific moment. Um, for, them for them, observation was of the mind and of ideas was equivalent with their generation. They followed the philosophy of Locke and Condillac in their basic assumption that the senses and the intellect were not simply given or innate, but rather achieved through exercise and especially through social interaction. What they basically did was translating these metaphysical assumptions into a functional framework of active observation. Thus, their method of observation had to grasp the mind from below the level of ideas and more complex mental operations. It had to trigger it from the level of sensibility to set and activate Victor's intellectual assets through the deliberate creation of needs. As Gerando puts it in a report, the method of observation had to multiply Victor's needs in order to expand his ideas and to fix his attention to teach him to give an account of himself, which is the only means to make him able to give an account of himself to others. In other words, the aim of the method of observation was to transform its object into an observer himself. Evidently, this transformational power of observation became central in the episode Educating Victor, as reported by his observer Jean Itard. His goal was to prove that Victor was educatable and could become part of society. In order to observe the development of Victor's moral order, Itard chose a day on which Victor behaved exemplary in the classroom and took advantage of this situation for punishing him unexpectedly and viciously. Itar reported the surprise he caused with his unexpected punishment and the enjoyment he himself felt being bitten by Victor in response. The reason was that this behavior constituted an entirely new form of resistance, which meant that Victor, in this moment, acted as a moral being, a behavior brought forth by the provocation of Itar himself. So we cite from Ita's uh, report to the ministry. You see it's, it's later. It's uh, two reports. It's a big story. If there would be times for discussion, I could uh, go into this. But, uh, um, so Ita uh, states in his, uh, in his report, could I enjoy myself less? It was an act of legitimate vengeance, an incontestable proof of his sentiment of justice and injustice. For my student, the eternal base of the social order wasn't alien anymore. By giving him this sentiment, or rather by provoking its development, I had raised the savage man to the full stature of the moral man. To awake Victor into a moral being, as absurd this, as this my idea might sound, does have an epistemological crux, which must not be lost here. This elevation is not the result of Ita's creation, he has not given Victor morality, as he himself admits, but rather provided the framework in which morality could be the original and spontaneous production of Victor himself. To conclude, my suggestion is that in Victor the paradoxes of a project of regeneration of man became apparent, where freedom and coercion are just the two sides of the same coin. The special feature of the method of observation presented by Gerando and demonstrated in the case of Victor with great success was about the activation and transformation of the observed object. The aim of this method was not only to produce a self-relationship based on individual morality, but to transform the relation between the self and the state as well. The political and moral foundation of knowledge where both are based on the active production of the moral self, as well as on the active establishment of institutions that should take over this function, should take over this function. The method of observation consisted both in the production of self-sufficient agent, as well as in the construction of systems that could manage the activity of these agents and their interaction. Figures like Joseph Marie de Gerando can show the way in which the project of observation was part of a larger project that attempted to redefine the boundary between state and society and to reconstitute the self within the system and outside of it. This is a point I would be happy to develop in the discussion. 
won't have. <laughs> wow, but I'm in time. <laughs> Sorry for this. <laughs> From this point, we have to rephrase the message of the theatrical piece we began with. For Gerando, the problem is no longer that being arrested is the condition of freedom, but that one has to turn oneself in, to, to hospitalize oneself, in order to actually be free. To be free is only possible when one stands under some form of observation, first by others and later as an adult by oneself. This paradox of sovereignty is not what Gerando wishes to dispose of, but rather to appropriate it and turn it into what can be called, perhaps, the metaphysics of administration of the self. Thank you.